All right. So I just want to start by saying thank you for being here. Um, it sometimes is a big ask to have people kind of get up out of bed, get here early. Um, but I know you guys are here to learn some important things, to get some good information. And I want to make sure you guys all have the tools you need to be effective in your startup journey. Um, so I'll take a little time to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Christian Williams. I'm on the startup banking team here with JP Morgan. Um, I see some more of my JP Morgan folks in the audience. Um, prior to this, I was a fintech founder. Um, so I've got some experience. I understand the journey. I know what it feels like to be lost, to kind of know, figure out where to go for information. And so my goal here is to give you guys some good information from our different funding alternative sources that can help you structure your financing so you can be much more successful in the future. Um, so I want to begin. Um, so I kind of want to start with some, some audience participation, if you guys don't mind. Um, so we're going to do a raise your hand exercise to get a sense for like who's actually in the room. Um, so if you are a startup founder or aspiring startup founder, a part of the C-suite team, raise your hand, raise your hand high. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. That's good. That's you're the audience we're looking to serve. So we're, we're in the right place. Um, so I want to get a raise your hand if you're an investor, aspiring investor, got a little money set aside that you, you know, spend on the right opportunity. Okay. A, a few, a few less. And then raise your hand if you need funding or you're planning on raising around soon or looking at different options. Okay, good. We are looking to speak to you directly. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask for a moment of bravery. Um, I need two people in the audience, preferably founders, to, to volunteer. We're going to ask three questions. I promise it won't be hard. But do we have any volunteers? Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll have you. you. You'll be next. Here's so, the microphone. You need the microphone to talk yeah. to the virtual attendees. So if you could first give us a quick intro of what you're working on. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Andre. Uh, my uh, startup is called Analytic, uh, working for AI for the enterprise. Basically, when enterprise builds a software release, just build the AI intelligence along with the release. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. And then are you raising or are you looking for any VC alternatives? We'll do three questions. Um, I, I'm not raising right away. I have to find some customers first to prove the concept, but uh, in a couple of months, I'll be raising. Perfect. And then last question here is, um, what kind of brought you here? What do you want to learn today? Like, wh how can we help? Uh, it's a way to meet smart people, uh, briefly. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. And then our next guy here, uh, I'll ask you the same questions. We'll start with your name, what you're building. Awesome. My name is Johar. I'm the co-founder, and these are my other two co-founders right here, of Astro Wellbeing, which is a employee recognition platform for healthcare employees dedicated to mitigating the burnout of these frontline healthcare employees through positive reinforcement. And to answer your other questions, we spent uh, last year and this year gaining a lot of traction and proof of concept. And right now we are in the middle of raising uh, a pre-seed round. Nice, nice, nice. And then what do you look to learn? What can we tell you? How can we add value to you today? Yeah, so we're all in our senior year of college, so more on the early stage. So we're kind of just really trying to learn, you know, the ins and outs of just fundraising, especially for a tech company like ourselves and just kind of learning and networking. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you guys. Give that, give that up to them. That's, that requires a, a little bit of bravery. Um, so the takeaways that we're hoping that you guys can get from today is the best use cases and best practices for each one of our vendors here. Um, Another thing is how to get the most out of each product. And then we want to talk a little about, about, about the future. What does the future of financing look like? What trends and patterns are we seeing in the marketplace? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we'll focus today. I'll do a quick little intro to our panelists and then we'll get started. Um, so I'll start with Ben. Um, ben is a strategic, is a manager of strategic accounts at CapChase, joining as the 25th employee in the first hire on the account management team. He's helped hundreds of SaaS companies tap into more than $200 million of non-dilutive capital over the past few years. Prior to CapChase, Ben served as chief, chief of staff for Cortex Sustainability Technology, a Series A prop tech firm in DC outside of work. Ben enjoys spending time in Brooklyn with his wife, Victoria, and their cute dog, Leo. He spends much of his time outside running, jogging, cycling, and recently completed a half marathon. So congratulations for Ben. Um, 
Next up here, we've got Tyler. He's an executive director on the JP Morgan team, working to support growth stage companies by bringing best in class capabilities to add value to the business throughout every stage of growth. Tyler's career has been solely focused on serving the innovation economy and world-class technology companies in the US and abroad. Prior to the JP Morgan, Tyler spent a number of years in Toronto building a venture debt practice. And in his free time, Tyler enjoys staying fit and spending time with his family. And thank you, Tyler. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Julia Rogers. Uh, she's the CEO and founder of HelloPrenup.com and a former Massachusetts family law attorney. She developed Hello Prenup after realizing there was a need amongst millennial couples for an affordable and quick collaborative approach to prenuptial agreements. Hello Prenup has been featured on Shark Tank and it got investments from Mr. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's been featured in the Boston Globe, GeekWire, CNN Business, amongst others. When she's not helping couples gain peaceful insight into prenuptial protections, Julia enjoys spending time near the waterfront with her daughter. Thank you, Julia. All right, so let's get started with our first question. Ben, we'll have you set the table for us. What is revenue-based financing and how can, how, can we, how can we use it? Perfect, yeah. Thanks, Christian. And also just so excited to see so many founders in the room. I think, you know, we're... Uh, Right. We we're hoping to set the stage for you all to understand, you know, what are what options are available. And so excited to speak to revenue financing here today. So what is revenue financing? I, I think I'd like to start with, um, you know, what what we were built to achieve, which is um, operating a startup is hard, especially in those early days. And fundraising is a full time job for 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 many founders. Uh, and it takes away focus from right the day to day. And, and sort of, you know, winning that next contract, sort of putting out all those fires. And so uh, revenue financing and CapChase specifically, right, is seeking to right, make accessing capital so much easier and scalable so that you can focus on the things that really move the needle in the business rather than just, you know, spending your time on, on, on securing financing. So, so what is it, right? It's for, and who's it for? Uh, it's for uh, revenue generating, uh, and at least in CapChase's uh, perspective, software, recurring revenue software businesses. Um, we typically work with companies that are, you know, right at that 100K in ARR mark or above. Um, and, and our, you know, we're a fintech company, right, that's, that's focused on financing, payments, and, and other workflow automations, and I'll focus on the financing today. Um, you know, what we allow you to do is, is, is to actually pull revenue forward. So, you know, when you sign a you know, an annual or multi-year contract, right? You've, you've done the hard work of getting that contract in place, but the actual cash isn't coming right away, right? But, but of course you need capital to serve that contract to, to continue to invest in your product. And so what we're allowing you to do is, is pull that revenue forward, you know, so once it's contracted, you know, you can have access to that cash, right? That goes out to investing in your team, building your product, um, you know, continuing to win that next deal, right? Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, we're, we're built and, and others in our space are built to really be a scalable solution, right? So when you're accessing capital, right, from that, you know, let's say you, you've pulled in that new contract and you're, you've, you've pulled that revenue forward, right? You're, you're now able to invest uh, in getting the next deal done, right? And of course, once you've done that, you're able to pull that revenue forward as well. And so you can kind of see where I'm going. There's a flywheel effect where, right, if you can grow more quickly, you can access more capital and, and you can do so without, right, tapping, uh, you know, more traditional VC and, and, and sort of diluting yourself in that way for the exit. So that's venture financing. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. Now let me ask a, a quick follow-up question. What are some pain points that a startup will normally come to you with and, and how do you guys kind of solve that pain point? Yeah, I think... I think the big one is right when we talk about this a lot internally, but happy to share with you all is like we don't want anyone to fear their own growth. And what I mean by that is, I'll, I'll, I'll pull an example of yeah. uh, uh, you know a, a hardware-enabled software company I work closely with. Right there, that you know they were on the cusp, you know, sitting at around two million in ARR, and they they were on the cusp of signing actually a three million dollar annual deal. Right, so more than double what their current business was supporting. Um, well. Of course, right. In order to actually serve that contract, they, they knew that they need to put in place a bunch, you know, hardware, uh, you know, across the country. Um, that has a known return, right? Like, you know, once that contract is is is, you know, implemented and and, and billing, of course, right? Like, we we have the paper in hand. We we know what it's going to yield, 
but but historically that you know my my friend would have had to go to uh you know vc or or other investors and sell part of his business in order to uh in order to actually serve a contract that has you know very little risk involved right and so i think right that that that's the you know the fear of your own growth right he was actually scared of of selling that next contract because he was concerned that he wasn't going to able going to be able to serve it right away and so i think that's where you know revenue financing comes in and says hey like you don't have to fear that, like your growth to the point where, um, you know, you're, you're, you might have right cash flow or, or liquidity concerns because that next deal is gonna, you know, uh, is gonna take a toll, right, on and, and require investments, right? That's what we're here to support, um, and and you know, we, right? He was able to sign that contract and and, and move forward with implementation and uh, you know without raising that outside capital. So, thank you. That was really powerful. Thank you. Um, so, Tyler. Um, for those unfamiliar, can you sort of give us a big picture? What is venture debt? And then talk a little bit about the difference between venture debt and maybe a traditional bank loan or traditional venture capital investment. Sure. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Speak up. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I think when we think about venture debt, really it is a bank loan, right? And if you think about maybe taking a step back, the difference between debt and equity, kind of the incentives an equity investor has to fund a business they're looking to get a return on their capital, hopefully a multiple of their capital. Um, and they're really bullish on a company or a founding team or an idea, and they're funding that, right? Um, venture debt's more similar to a bank loan where the bank isn't going to have some huge upside with retur multiple returns on their capital. They're not going to have one loan make a fund, so for example. So I think when you think of venture debt, it's more akin to a loan where it has to be repaid at some point, right? And we can get into a little bit, I think, through some of your more later questions yeah. around you know, what that means. But I think, um, you know, we really just look at it more from an equity type lens, right? When we're thinking about venture debt at its core, it's meant to provide value to founders and early investors to retain leverage, both in the upside and the downside, right? So as, as bankers doing venture debt, we're looking at, you know, who's in the business from an equity backing perspective, what are the metrics this business is trying to hit? And, you know, do they have a path to hit those metrics, whether that's, you know, new large anchor customers, growing ARR, improving metrics, you know, hiring on, um, expanding the leadership team, things of that nature. There's a number of, you know, use cases, right? But at the end of the day, it's really meant to extend runway for a business and a founder. So hopefully everything goes great and, you know, you, you, you burn through your equity cash and then you have another slug of capital to help you continue executing on that growth plan, growing your enterprise value. So when you go back to market, you as a founder, uh, you're able to re retain hopefully a larger piece of a larger pie versus if you didn't have that, you know, extra runway and you had to raise capital uh, maybe s sooner than you would have liked to do. Yeah. And we, we also want to kind of get a better sense for what, what problem are you solving? Where, where is the, the gap in the marketplace that venture debt comes in and fills for for founders who are raising around or considering raising around. How should they think about it? I realize I didn't answer one of your last questions. I think <laughs> really it comes down to the uncertainty of you know pot generating cash flow, right? I think if you look exactly. at a traditional bank loan, a bank's going to look at assets. They're going to look at your cash flow. They're going to say, okay, what's your EBITDA? Let's lever it up and give you you know two to three times that and you know underwrite to the sustainability of those cash flows over time. Um, as you all know, with early and growth stage companies, there is typically no cash flow and you know, you're know you not trying to get to cash flow. That's not necessarily the ultimate goal when you raise a series A, right? It's to grow the business, grow the enterprise value. Um, so I think the, the use case is really, um, or the problem it's solving, so to speak, is, is that uncertainty around your next round of financing. Uh, and again, it, it's more beneficial uh, to have that leverage in the upside. It's also beneficial in the downside. I think, you know, if, if things aren't going so well, debt might not be what you want to add to your, you know, your list of things to deal with, but um, it, it can help in those situations as well. If you've yeah. got maybe a, you know, a large contract that's just coming in and you just need to get a little more capital in the door um, to, to service it uh, and get it implemented. Um, so there are use cases, but I think it, you know, it's not ever meant to be from our perspective, bridge financing. We're not looking to bridge to that next round of equity. Um, and we can get into that again through some yeah. of your later well, questions, but hopefully that gives a, a bit of context around what yeah. we're trying to solve for. And, and to stick, oh, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious, is the venture debt, what's the actual company? 
Oh, well, hold on. So let me um. Let's you need the microphone mic. for the yeah. virtual people. So we'll, we'll run it over. Apologies. Is the venture debt for the actual company that is owing the money, or is it like an individual person, like the CEO, whoever it might be? Good, good yeah, question. question. So I think maybe taking a step back, when we're thinking about the the company that is probably most well suited for venture debt, not to skip ahead too far. Yeah, please. Um, I think typically it's it's you, you've had an institutional round of financing. 18 months ago, maybe that was a seed round. I think in today's market, it's probably, you know, series A and later companies. So you, you have a real business built around your product, your idea, your, your team. Um, so, so to answer your question directly, the debt is to the company, right? And the bank's taking an all asset lien on the business. Um, and, it, you know, different lenders will do it different ways. But generally speaking, the way we view the world is, you know, we're not asking founders to personally guarantee this debt. And to take a step back, we've got Ben here who says, hey, my company's generating revenue. We can give you a portion of your revenue in the future. And then what Tyler is saying is, hey, you've just raised a round and we can add money to that round so that you're running out of cash. But both people are kind of solving this same problem of, gosh, I'm, I'm running out of cash or I can't fulfill orders. What can I do? Let's think about this a little bit differently. Julia, can you give us a, a, a brief background on your company and then how you originally thought about funding? Absolutely. Um, so I started Hello Prenup. Um, I was working as a family law attorney and I was talking to potential clients looking for prenups. And the overarching theme was that nobody wants to hire a divorce lawyer before they get married, right? <laughs> totally understandable. So, um, you know, they had three main issues. They wanted a process that felt more collaborative. They wanted something that was faster. My firm required three months to create a prenup. People were like, I'm getting married next week. So what does that mean for me? And they didn't want to pay thousands of dollars, understandably, right? So it was like $3,500 with my firm. It's only half the prenup. Whereas I thought there's got to be a way to leverage technology to create something that's faster, more collaborative, and cheaper. Um, so that's how I came up with Hello Prenup. Um, what was your next question? And then talk a little <laughs> bit about how you originally thought about funding. Yeah. So initially I, I came up with a wireframe um, and I thought, okay, I have to now build this out into a platform and this is going to be very expensive. So I went out, I went to Upwork um, and I found a bunch of developers who were willing to give me quotes and their quotes were like crazy. I mean, like 50,000 here, 200,000 there. And like, that's not that much for development, but for me personally, it was a lot. So I, I went and I pitched at a couple different um, angel competitions and I just got shut down time after time. They said, there's no market for this. Um, I don't see how this could scale. Um, I don't even see how this is legal. And I was getting really frustrated. I didn't, I didn't know like, how am I going to do this? I finally found a developer um, in India who was willing to work with me. Um, and I had to get up every single morning at four o'clock in the morning to meet with him to kind of organize what my MVP was going to look like, um, walk through the wireframe. And of course, there are some fundamental differences in business structure and law and user experience between the United States um, and foreign countries. So there was a lot of intricacies. I kind of became a product manager um, before I knew what a product manager was. Um, and so that's how I built it. And I paid them little by little, I mean, cash out of my own pocket. Obviously, I had to keep a full-time job. Um, luckily, at that point, I didn't have kids yet because kids are expensive. Um, <laughs> and, and, so, and so that's how I, how I built my MVP, despite... Yeah been turned down. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can, can you talk about um, what changed and sort of what led you going the non-venture capital route? Yeah. I mean, I ultimately, um, I think I was able to build a really great team. Um, so I think having founders, um, co-founders that are experts in their fields is essential. Um, actually, one of my co-founders here today, Doug Julian, um, and he was an expert in SEO and digital strategy. So he was the first person I said, okay, if I'm going to build this company, I need you on my team because I have no money. Um, so I have no idea how else I'm going to do this. Um, and then, um, you know, I came to a point where the development of this product was becoming really complicated. And again, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a tech person. Um, and so I, I met my now other co-founder, Sarah Beth, um, she's our CTO and she was really passionate about this project, um, and was willing to work on it full time. She was an engineer out of Microsoft. Um, and so, 
we were able to really leverage um, human capital as a way to bridge the gap where we didn't have, um, we weren't able to raise at the time. Um, and that's how we we built out an MVP that, you know, literally two months before we filmed Shark Tank. <laughs> So that, that that kind of adds a little bit of a clarity here. So we've got different ways to, to fund it. And I think Julia's main point is going to be around discipline financing. Um, but let's let's dig into that a little bit more. Tyler, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you. Um, when's the best time to apply? What uh, what's the best use of proceeds from from venture debt? I've, I've got the money. What do you think are some best use cases for what to do with that type of money? Yeah. And I, and I think maybe the I'll use the umbrella you know, analogy. It's like the worst time to try to buy an umbrella is when it's raining. So maybe to not answer your question, but kind of answer it. I think one of the worst times to try to get venture debt is when you need it. Right? Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, we've, we've seen that countless times. So uh, I think the best time to get it is, you know, you've just come off a raise or you are raising, you know, an institutional round of capital because um, the venture debt really is meant to augment that capital. It's not to, meant to be a replacement for equity. It's meant to augment the equity uh, maybe help adjust the, the capital stack a little bit. Um, maybe reduce the, the amount of equity you have to raise if you have access to to venture debt. Um, and then, sorry, what was your second question? And then the second part is you've got the money. Okay. How do I, how should I use it? What do you what, what what are some use cases that you've seen that's been effective for people? Yeah, I think you know the use case really is the the runway extension, right? So think of it as again a complement to equity. It's it's cash in your account. It's money on your balance sheet. Use that money how you would use any other equity dollars that you're bringing in to, to really extend your runway. Um, so you can keep plowing into growth initiatives, product development, uh, key hires. I mean, there's no, typically when you're looking at venture debt from a bank, there's no restrictions on how you can use it as long as you're not you know going out and buying a franchise of restaurants or something crazy <laughs> like that. Um, so it really is just your cash to use how you see fit and, and there's no prescribed use of uh, proceeds for the debt typically. Yeah. Yeah, please. Wait, wait, wait. But we're going to have um, Puck is going to grab a, a microphone for you. And if you don't mind, just kind of saying your name and then ask your question. Uh, hi, Igor here. Can you differentiate venture debt at the way that you're describing it versus a line of credit? Because it sounds like venture debt, debt is money all at once and a line of credit is... Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So I think... The, the easiest way to think about venture debt is almost like a mortgage that you would get for a house, right? So you're funded a chunk of capital day one, and then you have to make the monthly interest and principal payments over 30 years for a mortgage. But for venture debt, it's more typically three to four years. Um, so you do typically have access to the money day one. You're not, you know, again, this is all generalities, right? So it depends company by company how things are structured. N normally, there's not a requirement to draw it all day one. There's typically a you know, interest only period where you have access to draw the capital. Maybe it's 12, 18, 24 months, depending on the lender and, and kind of what the structure is. Um, so it really gives you the optionality to to have the, the capital available, but not necessarily need to pay interest on money that you don't need at that period. So um, again, flexible to draw the capital, but then there is structured repayment versus a line of credit where you, know, you can borrow, pay back, borrow, pay back, um, so it's a, it's much more static of a, a, a loan facility. All is, right. that, is that helpful to yeah. frame it? Okay. Yep. And then we've got another question here. Thank, thank you. I'm the uh, question man. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious. Depending on the economy, does that interest rate go higher or lower? Or do you guys usually just have like a set interest rate? Like, is it kind of like a mortgage in that way, or is it just like, hey? It's 5% in 1999 and it's 5% in 2023. Yeah, another great question. So it's going to prop interest rates move with the economy, right? So as banks, um, you know, the cost of capital goes up, the return that is required to make these loans make sense goes up, right? So uh, in, a, in a low interest rate environment, like we saw a couple of years ago, rates were, it was very attractive. Debt was very attractive. And now I think with rates where they are today, um, it, you know, it's a bit harder of a decision for companies to take on that debt. Um, and again, I think we get into maybe when it doesn't make sense for venture debt, right? Is that if you're having to service that debt, high interest payment, and you're an early stage company, like you effectively, if, if you don't kind of hit those milestones, raise that next round of capital, um, you're artificially cutting your runway in half, right? Because now you have to make those loan payments. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a good question around the Any, interest rates. Anyone else? 
Okay, perfect, perfect. So thanks for adding that context. We got one more venture debt question. Oh yeah, please. And if it's, you're in the, uh, um, sorry, if you're in the virtual audience, please ask your questions to the chat. We're happy to answer. I got a hundred emojis. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Stan Tomlinson, a little bit in the weeds. He says, SBIR grants must now be capitalized per revised act section 174 in the IRS code. Would a five-year venture debt be appropriate to pay those taxes until they are credited on future tax returns? Maybe better for a tax I think professional. You should talk to your, uh, your, your accountant <laughs> yeah. about that. In tax, yeah, that may be a little bit too specific. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we talked a little bit more about venture debt proceeds, a little bit about structure, um, some best practices. Uh, Julia, we're going to kind of kind of lean on you for a second. Um, what strategies and, and tools should people employ to make their money stretch a little bit further? Um, so for, I can only speak from my experience, but for us, it was the use of contractors. Um, so outside of our core founding team who was willing to work um, for free for, you know, we did not pay ourselves a dime for the first year. Um, we utilized contractors as much as we could. Um, and I think the value in contractors is that especially if you put the time into training them and forming really good relationships with them is that they, it's basically a year long or however long you use them as contractors interview process. So for us, um, you know, my now CMO, Lauren, um, she was the very first person I hired. Um, and again, you know, I was funding this myself, so I had no money to hire her. I only used her like maybe 10 hours a week, um, for the first year and a half. And then she was the very first person I was I hired full time because really she she um, did the job of a CMO for you know a contractor's pay. She's the one who formed um, the the vision for how we wanted to market this company. Um, she is the one whose voice is all over the website. So there's incredible value in that. Um, the same is true with who, the woman who's now our head of legal. Um, her name's Nicole, and she was a contractor for Hello Prenup for about two years. Um, writing again, again, it, like it just becomes this kind of long interview process, and I think it's a really smart thing to do because um, it allows you the opportunity to become profitable sooner if you don't have that overhead of star full-time employees. I think, especially in what is now a virtual world, there's more opportunity um, to work with those contractors more meaningfully. So that's that's kind of my best advice. Perfect. And then let me follow that up with the, with the question about milestones. Yeah. Um, what milestones made it possible for you to not need that external um, funding? And what type of kind of advice can you give for, for people? Yeah. So for us, it was pure profitability. Um, so year one, we became a million dollar a year company um, and have grown exponentially since then. Um, that milestone was a really big one. Um, but I think even more so than that was like the day we were able to pay ourselves living wages was pretty incredible um, because it allowed us to then take that extra money. I mean, this is really simple stuff, but dump it into growing the business, scaling the business in a meaningful way. So I think it's it's less sexy to say, oh, like we grew really slowly. We didn't take on funding. And I think sometimes people get kind of stuck in the idea of, okay, I need to go raise a couple million dollars. So when I go to the party and I talk about this startup I'm working on, I can say, I raised so much money, look how successful we are. But you have to remove the ego from the funding because funding does not mean you're successful. It just means someone believed in you. Congratulations. If you're not profitable, I mean, it's, you're not successful yet. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then Ben, so we've made our way around back to you. Um, we're, at, we're looking for stories and scenarios from you, Ben. Um, can you give us some stories and scenarios where you were able to, to help a company and kind of talk a little bit about how they were able to, to benefit? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so full disclosure, actually, before I joined CapChase, I was chief of staff at a, at a prop tech company in DC. I only bring that up because um, it was in that role that we became one of the first customers of CapChase. So I was uh, like... The decision maker on the other side, and 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 I, I kind of want to tell that story because, um, you know, it, it it transformed our financial strategy to use CapChase, and obviously that's why I jumped ship eventually. <laughs> um, so uh, of course, uh, 2020 was a weird year for prop tech. 
Um, imagine our surprise when uh, a pandemic broke out for the first time in my lifetime um, and, and no one was going into the office. And our, our company was focused on uh, energy efficiency in office spaces. Mm. So um, if all the lights are turned off and the AC is not on, you're pretty optimized. Uh, you don't really <laughs> need technology to tell you that. And so, um, uh, you know, it was a difficult time. And, and so we were literally heading into our Series A raise. Um, you know, in, in, in Q1 of 2020 uh, and had to put that on hold. And so um, for me, uh, I was quite stressed out uh, as, you know, a supporter, uh, you know, and sort of managing our financial planning, seeing that we have six to nine months of runway, right? Uh, you know, a full payroll and, um, and, and all of our, you know, the potential equity investors are saying, hey, we want to see how this thing plays out that this thing being the pandemic before we're, we're going to move forward in diligence. Um, so fortunately, you know, we put our heads down and said, all right, it's kind of a waste of our time to, to, to spin wheels on, on the series a raise right now. Investors just aren't, aren't, aren't feeling confident in the market uh, for in prop tech specifically. Uh, and so what can we do to extend runway, right. And then focus more, you know, back on, on, on growing the business and, and sort of operating effectively. Uh, and so that's where cap chase came into play. So, you know, we still had six to 12 months of runway. Uh, but what we were able to do was, you know, pull forward uh, some of our, you know, ARR a a as capital, right. We did continue to cut costs as well and extended our runway from, you know, nine months to closer to 24 months, mm -hmm. gave ourselves, right. Uh, I mean, priceless almost time for that business to to secure that next raise, right? And 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 without right laying off any of our employees, by the way. Um, and so uh, we did, of course, end up raising our Series A. In fact, we raised venture debt uh, uh, alongside that, so can talk to that as well. Um, <laughs> but but I think that that is an example of right that that optionality you have, um, you know, that as as Tyler mentioned, right, venture debt is not like designed to be that bridge. And so, um, but, but, but revenue financing can be, uh, and, and you can get that answer in like 48 to 72 hours often. So, you know, it's, it's often worth asking the question. Perfect. Perfect. And thank you. And so, um, let's transition a little bit. Um, Tyler, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you with a question that we talked about earlier, which is like, what happens when something bad happens? They get the venture debt, but the idea doesn't work out. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the downside risk and sort of what founders should be thinking about and from that standpoint? Yeah, and, and I alluded to it a bit. I think, you know, if, if, if things are going great for your company, venture that's a great tool to retain a lot of leverage, um, retain a bigger piece of a bigger pie. Um, if things aren't going so well, you know, I think maybe part of the strategy, right, is like as an early stage company, you hope your board is very strong you know, giving good advice, helping guide you. They've been there, done that. So in a perfect situation, if things aren't going well, your board's saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't pull that debt, right? Because it just complicates things, you know, a lot. If you if you have debt that you owe to a bank, they've got to lean on your business. You need to service that debt. Um, it just complicates everything. So I think, you know, hopefully, you know, the best outcome is you don't draw the debt. And you kind of, you know, you, you go through that trouble and the cost to put it in place. You end up not using it. Uh, you're no worse for it. Um, but if and I have to be careful, I think what I say, cause each situation is so different, right? right. If a company is, is going through some tough times, but I think, you know, the main thing that I would say is like, it's, it's why it's so important to have a good partner on the other side of these deals, right? You want someone who's seen these situations, knows, knows how to kind of treat their clients as a partner and not just say, okay, well, the company's not working out. We're going to take our money back and kind of ride off into the sunset. And I think, you know, as everyone knows here, venture is a long-term relationship game uh, it's a small ecosystem no matter what what city you're in right like it's the same folks that kind of pop up a lot so I think you know that incentivizes both sides to act as partners um, so I'd say you know maybe less about how it plays out but I think it's it just goes back to the importance of having good counsel from your board you know a good partner on the other side um, and, and really being careful about you know how much you're lever levering up a cash burning business right again if you've got those debt service payments that you have to make and you also have to make payroll and you've also got to pay your vendors and the company's maybe not going through the growth that you'd expected. Um, you know, again, art artificially your, your runway is being cut short. So you just got to be careful about the, the use of debt because it's, it's not for every, every company. 
Perfect, perfect. And, and Julia, I'm going to throw you a little curveball here. Um, uh -oh. One, I just want to say shout out to you for having a full circle moment. You graduated from this law school and now you're here as a panelist. So that's yes. amazing. Um, and then I think the coolest part about your story that seems to give you the most press is uh, your Shark Tank experience. Um, so if you could kind of share a little bit about that experience and, and sort of how it worked for you in that in the context of, of funding, because you were able to get funding from that and how it affected your business. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, primarily one of the reasons we went on Shark Tank was obviously it's incredible press. Um, and we were really excited about the opportunity to meet the sharks. Um, and Kevin O'Leary is someone who, you know, <laughs> I've been trying to get in touch with for many, <laughs> many years. Um, I knew he was a Boston guy didn't work out. I always think everything happens for a reason. So when I went on Shark Tank, the first thing I said was, Kevin, I'm from Boston, um, <laughs> which elicited absolutely no reaction. Um, <laughs> and, but, but I think, you know, we did get funding from Shark Tank, um, but that wasn't the primary purpose. Um, we ended up um, significantly uh, renegotiating the deal after Shark Tank, which is something that I think a lot of people know happens. Um, and we looked at um, the funding as really strategic. So it was an opportunity to bring in Kevin. It was an opportunity. Our other investor is Nirav Tolia. Um, he's the founder of Nextdoor.com. He was the guest shark um, that season. And um, we've really utilized them as advisors more than anything else. Um, we also used um, our relationships with them to kind of leverage additional investment, um, which we got from Brian Liu, who's the founder of LegalZoom, shortly thereafter. Um, so we've looked at it as, I think, more of an opportunity to build out our team of advisors. Um, an opportunity to surround ourselves by people who are experts in their fields and have differing points of view. Um, Nirav, for example, comes from an area of tech that is, you know, heavily funded. Um, he was not a bootstrap founder, so he has a very different perspective than someone like Brian Liu, who built LegalZoom over the course of 20 years in legal tech. You know, before legal tech, he basically invented legal tech, right? Didn't exist 20 years ago. So um, I think... We, we utilize these people for very different reasons um, and this opportunity for different reasons. And that, you know, would be a piece of advice that I give um, any bootstrap founders is surround yourself by experts um, because they, they love to help you. You know, people want to be advisors because they want to help. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Ben, we're coming back to you and we're going to focus a little bit more um, on the future here, Ben. So, if you could tell us what trends you're seeing in the revenue-based financing space, and then how should founders think about that as they're sort of thinking about ways to, to grow their business? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, revenue financing is a newer space, and, and, and it's come in a few different forms, but its popularity has grown quite a bit um, in the last three years or so. Uh, and I, I mentioned that because there have been, you know, a number of players entering the space and, and Capchase is one of them, but there are a few. Um, I think Tyler mentioned this before, but right, picking your partner is really important. And, and so if I'm sitting in your shoes, right, considering, you know, exploring my options in this space, I just think, you know, it's, it's really important to know if I'm going to make, you know, have a partner over the long run, right? You want to make sure that, you know, uh, not only are they going to be around for the long run, right, which is important. Are they well capitalized, right? Do they have the right products to, to serve me while I scale? But also, uh, you know, and like relationally, you know, are they, in, are they aligned with my business, right? Like, you know, are these the type of people that I know are going to, you know, pick up my phone call when, when right, I, I'm having a bad month and, and need to walk through the numbers and make sure that right, the model still works. And so I'll just say, right, like it, it, important to make sure you pick the right partner. And, um, you know, I like to think Capchase is a great partner, but, but there are some others out there as well that, you know, is good people. Um, another trend I just want to point to is, you know, we talked about, right, revenue financing is all about bringing that future cash flow forward. And, and, and one thing that, you know, is starting to crop up quite a bit and, and Capchase is, is leading this space, but again, right, there are others, is, is actually like B2B, buy now, pay later. So we're starting to see actual, you know, third parties like Capchase or others enter into the payments uh, flow between two businesses in their transaction. And in our case, right, what it allows for is both parties to optimize on the, the, the contract structure. So if you're selling a contract, you can get paid up front, but your customer can pay over time. And, and, and there, you know, 
if you've ever used Klarna or Firm, right, uh, as a consumer, it's similar to that. Um, but you know, right now, cash is king for everyone, and so it it allows both parties to 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 enjoy the you know maximum benefit from from payment terms, but neither have to sacrifice their cash flow specifically. Um, I think that you know, the, the, you're going to see that a lot more. I think that the market is going to start to realize that this is just uh, accepted, right? And, 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 and your buyers will be used to paying that way. And, and it will give you flexibility to, to uh, again, optimize for your own cash, which is just so important. Wow. Thank you. That, and that, that's a new one to me. So it looks like we've got a question here. So I'm going to try to delay a little bit to give Puck some time to, to run over. So he's, he's got a question. Um, and then if anybody else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we can dive a little deeper. Uh, this is a question for Ben, actually. Can you differentiate revenue-based financing? And I think there's probably a couple of e-commerce folks in the room versus like a merchant cash advance, which is normally thought of as like a loan shark. Because I think they're different. It's more of an alley-oop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the e-commerce space or, or, or merchant cash advances. Well, Ben, let me let me jump in here because uh, I'm fairly familiar with that. So a lot of people use merchant um, financing. What they do is you'll get a call from someone. They do quick underwriting. They only ask for a few bank statements and they give you a lump sum of money. And for that lump sum of money, they pull money out of your account on a daily basis. So this happens in the restaurant industry a lot where they'll run into trouble. They'll need an emergency loan. You're charging 100 to 200 percent um, interest, but they're pulling the money out every single day. And so a $10,000 loan can turn into an $18,000 repayment. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how your company may be different than, than that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the first thing is just that, like, uh, in, in terms of security interest or like how we, right, when you transact with us or, or someone like us, right, you're going to be given a repayment schedule, right? And that's going to be the schedule you pay. It won't change. And in fact, different from maybe traditional venture debt, um, right, it's a fixed rate for, for whatever that transaction mean, is. Meaning, right, to the cent, you know what that cash flow is going to look like uh, over the next 12, 24 months, whatever it might be. The second thing is historically we're, we're we're much lighter weight in terms of security interest, right? So we're we're not typically taking an all asset lien on the business, um, and and so what that means is that like we are only going to be successful if you are, right? We have plenty to lose if 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 your business right isn't if things aren't going according to plan. But that also means that in the downside scenario, we're mutually really aligned to get things back on track. And I think that. It's that uh, it's that a uh, you know a, aligned it's that alignment that that really right drives the partnership over the long run because um, you know our success is your success and vice versa. Oh, perfect, good question. Anybody else has any questions? Oh, we got a couple more. One here and then one in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony. Uh, I'm coming from the founder perspective. Uh, ben, I have a question for you. So uh, when I was hearing about revenue financing, the first thing that came to mind was the Enron story, mark to market accounting, uh, kind of digging a huge hole with that. Uh, just wondering kind of what the reporting looks like for revenue based financing and how it may differ from that. So. Yeah. When, and when you say reporting, you mean like, like, like uh, you're reporting back to us as lender, or yeah, our like reporting? like balance sheets, taxes, stuff like that. Like, yeah. is it revenue on on the business's side, or is it debt? Like, what does it look like? Yeah, um, it depends on the structure. So, like, there are a, a few different ways that the contracts work, but um, uh, it, in many cases, it's 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 seen as debt on the balance sheet. Um, in, in some cases it can be applied to, um, like accounts receivable. Um, so it, yeah, it kind of depends. Got it. And then she's got a question in the back. Yeah. Go back, back, back. Ladies first. Hi, my name is Lisa Frustar. Actually, tomorrow I'm giving a talk with a bunch of people on different funding options at 1030. So put in a plug for that. Yeah. And I've actually been doing revenue-based financing um, investing for about five years. It can generally be structured either as debt or equity. But the salient point is that you make a commitment to pay a fixed percentage of your revenue. So the, in other words, um, the drag on your business is predictable. Um, but I do have a question, which is that all of these funding structures are kind of esoteric if you're not in financial services. So in practice, 
-hmm. What advice do you have to the people in this room on how to navigate it? A lot of companies choose different funding structures at different times. So determining the pros and cons, what's right for a particular time and an investor in a company can be really challenging. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So I'm going to help the panelists by being the person to like talk about best use cases for kind of each one um, from a macro standpoint. I think when we talk about venture debt, what we're talking about is I've raised a round and I want to add some additional capital on the side to extend my runway. So this is about making sure that as things come up, if there's a downside opportunity that I'm protected. Um, I think with revenue based financing, my money, I'm, I'm printing money. I'm growing super, super quickly, but I'm afraid that I'm going to outgrow the cash that's in my account. At some point, I'm going to get a $3 million contract and I won't be able to fulfill that contract because I don't have any money left over. And so I want to be able to have the money in a predictable way that I can pay back, um, that can grow my business. And then the other way to do it is just to, you know, to, to, to cut expenses, to, wake up at five o'clock in the morning and to meet with the, your development team and to build. Um, and so there are different ways that we can use each one, but I'm hoping that that kind of gives you some practical use cases um, for, for each person up here. And hopefully that, that kind of helps. I think we had a question here. Yeah. Hi, hi there, I'm Zan from the UK. My first question is, is what's the sort of minimum amount of revenue that you need to sort of start activating the revenue-based financing. And then the second question leading onto that is, are there any initiatives at the moment to help sort of the startups and the entrepreneurs at the very early stages of, of their revenue where they might be doing sort of 5,000 pounds a month or 2,000 pounds a month for this revenue-based financing? And if they're not, what's sort of holding you back helping these entrepreneurs at, at the beginning with it? Yeah, so the, the short answer is our minimum is 100K ARR, which is, um, just to be clear, like well before uh, many other right, lenders are ever going to consider financing. That, I mean, um, that's a huge milestone, um, but uh, you know, if you consider that we're, we're underwriting future cash flow, right, that's a, a, a relatively smaller base. Um, so, uh, you know, we all, we have plenty of conversations with folks well before that, though. And I think that, you know, it's, I mean, the advice I would give is like, start developing the relationships, understand how these businesses work well ahead of your need. I think Tyler mentioned that earlier, because we're going to be ready to go once, once you, you know, hit that milestone um, and, uh, and are excited to, to be that partner. Uh, I'm not sure I heard or answered the second question. I just want to make sure. What's what's holding you back? Looking at sort of entrepreneurs below that sort of mark, like the sort of fifty thousand pounds. Yeah, I think historically, the you know the the smaller the the you know the firm, the the startup, perhaps the 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 higher the risk, uh, you know, for scaling to that next milestone. And for us, like. Just frankly, I think it comes down to the economics of of you know putting in the underwriting and, and the work on on a deal that small. For us, um, it, it it's just not the unit economics quite aren't there. Um, so we do have right, we have other tools though, um, and I think others in the space as well. So we have like um, you know a, a a product focused on collections that helps automate right reaching out to your customers as a pure software. We're offering that for free right now. Totally applicable right, if you've got revenue under. You know, but you just don't hit that milestone. Um, so we've got some products that that can help certainly below that. Just on the financing side, perhaps uh, we'd we'd wait a little bit. Perfect. And then, Julie, I'm gonna kind of have it as you to, the person to close us out here. Um, you talked a little bit about advice, um, but I know there's a lot of people in here who resonate with what you're saying. They want to sign up for that journey. They want to bootstrap the whole thing. Stay up late you know, really put their all into the business. Can you sort of give them a little bit of advice? Um, I know you said work with work with good partners. What what else can they take from you that can like help them on that journey? Um, well, first of all, don't get up at four o'clock in the morning because that's miserable. Um, <laughs> I'd say rethink financing or um, a raise, a capital raise. I mean, if you don't need that money to build your product, then I think you really need to 
understand or, or under, yeah, understand why you're doing it. Um, and if, you know, if you can build your product without it, or even if you do raise, um, to build a product, I think from there, it's almost better if you have your back against the wall because you have to get creative. Um, in my experience, you know, like I, I said a couple of times before, I didn't have that, that cushion. So I had to figure it out. I had to build a lot of content. I had to build SEO because it was free. Um, but that's paying dividends now because, you know, my cost of acquisition is super low. Um, second, I would say build your team thoughtfully. Um, the people who you found your company with, I mean, it's like a marriage, right? <laughs> I mean, and your operating agreement is like your prenup. I had to put that in there. Um, and so I, I think you need to make sure you're building with people ha who have shared vision, um, but who also can thoughtfully disagree because that kind of exchange of constant ideas and innovating and iterating based off of your product, but doing so in a way that is really healthy um, is key to beating the competition. So yeah, I, I would say rethink financing and then really um, make sure you're founding your company with people that you actually like um, and who are innovative. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, everybody give a round of applause. This was really, really good. Thank you so much. So. I purposely left a little time at the end so we can answer any additional questions. So we've got a couple. So we're going to put Puck to work today. Puck will be sprinting back and forth. So we've got a question over here, question in the back, question in the front. So we'll try to answer some of these. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so for my MVP, I spent about one hundred and fifty thousand wow. dollars of my own money. It's very wow. painful, um, <laughs> but obviously it was worth it. Um, and again, a lot of that was done because I didn't have a CTO. So I was just I think a, a lot of that money could have been saved if I had someone who knew what they were doing and I wouldn't have made those errors um, in terms of preparing for Shark Tank. I mean, there's only so much you can do, right? You know they're going to cut it the way that they want to cut it. We filmed for 90 minutes um, and they cut it down to six minutes. Um, so just we had to really know our business inside and out. Um, you know, I was a little nervous as a lawyer, like <laughs> talking on national television, like what's going to happen to me? Um, but I, I think for anybody who's interested in going on Shark Tank, I mean, my best advice is to just know everything um, because the sharks really respect that as much as, you know, it is television and there is a process of cutting to keep it entertaining. Um, the sharks are really respectful, wonderful business people. Perfect. Yeah. Who else? Uh, I think you had a question up front. Oh, you're good. Okay. In the back. State your name. Hey, my name is Mario. A quick question to Ben and Taylor uh, regarding your product. So what particular cues do you, use, do you evaluate when evaluating risk to, to provide the capital in case so, so I, I'm asking from the founder's perspective in case we sometimes we require uh, this type of route. So who wants to tackle it first? You'll go first. I think the short answer is it really depends on the business, you know, the ask, who's backing the business, what vertical you're, so it, like it, it's very esoteric around what we're looking at. I think as a, as a founder, if you're going to raise venture debt, um, just be prepared to go through a diligence process and have your, you know, Generally speaking, at least like a reviewed financial or an audit, um, you know, kind of make sure your financial house is in order. I think, you know, we typically the advice I give is like the best time to go talk to a bank about debt is when you've just raised equity because you've got the data room. It's fresh. You don't have to go re refresh a bunch of stuff so you can kind of run the process concurrently uh, with the equity raise. So um, I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think as you're gearing up for venture debt, just expect it to be, you know, pretty intense diligence, right? Because we're looking at venture debt, very similar to how an equity investor would look at um, put, writing a check into a company. Perfect. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, uh, CapChase, right? We believe that the best use of proceeds for our financing is revenue generating activities. And, and what that means is that when we're evaluating a company, we want to see that, you know, when you, you, you have a good, even if it's really early stage, but 
some grasp of you know your go to market engine so a dollar right putting a dollar into customer acquisition ad spend sales people whatever um, is going to yield a return right and so we look for um, trends across you know sales efficiency customer you know LTV to CAC some of these metrics um, uh, you know around growth and efficiency around growth and so I would just it's never too early to think about growth efficiency um, so that's what I'd say. Yeah. And then I think we got a quick one here, and then this will be the last question. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Gary Ludorf, um, startup founder. Julie, I wanted to say congratulations for your creativity, your innovative ways in bootstrapping this company. I don't think $150,000 is really that much money. So you did a <laughs> fabulous job. Yeah. Secondly, uh, for you, a non technical person, to be able to deliver a product out of India. This, this challenge is the most technical of people to do that, right? <laughs> this is very difficult to do. So congratulations on that. You could probably do well to even talk about, consult as you are now, about bootstrapping. I think people need to understand that a bit better. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you evidently got a CMO that was a crackerjack CMO for pennies on the dollar. I mean, was this somebody that you already knew prior to? It was. Yeah, no, it was not. Um, so Lauren, um, so Doug Julian, who's um, did all of our digital strategy and SEO, is someone that I knew prior. Um, and I roped him in and convinced him this was a good idea. Um, so I'm <laughs> grateful for his participation. Um, and then um, Lauren, who's now my CMO, um, no, she. I found her on Upwork. Um, and she was actually someone who had gotten a prenup um, and it did not work out well for her. So she was kind of attracted to the mission. Um, and, it had, and I think is part of why, you know, we laugh, but it's part of why she was able to market the product so well, because she had been that person. She had wanted something like a hello prenup um, to be able to explain her rights and her options. And that didn't exist at the time she needed it. So I think part of the success is, you know, not only the fact that it was pure luck that she was available and on Upwork and I found her, um, but also finding someone who has actual real world experience with the product. Last quick thing. In the bootstrapping process, did you give away any equity? Um, well, obviously to my co-founders, yeah. At the beginning, I owned 100% of the company and I no longer do. Um, but I think, you know, that's so well worth it. I, I it wouldn't have been possible to build a company like this without co-founders that I have. So I'm very grateful for their, yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thank you guys. Excellent. Excellent session.